Praise God. I opened up my notes and there's nothing there. So we'll see what happens. So we'll see what happens. That was fun. So that was a couple of firsts for you. I, I know we said, we talked about the first time that, that we well the, first, the guests that are here for the first time. Uh, Pastor Steve came up and did uh, communion for the first time. Come on, that's the first time he's ever done that. Praise God. My notes are here. Praise God for that. And uh, of course, Pastor Brad doing announcements for the first time. He's preached here a couple of times, but announcements for the first time here. First time here. He's done it before though. So exciting. I wanted to, I wanted to uh, tell you about one more thing that I saw today because I, 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 I just love this. And I, I know I'm going to single somebody out, but please, I see it all the time. I, I know that many of you do this. I just happened to see it today and it stuck out to me as something really awesome and really cool. So I'm, I'm back, I'm, I'm out in the lobby before service and just kind of mingling around. And, and I was in that back hall where the kids' rooms are and, and our, our storage room and all that. And I was back there. And uh, I just happened to see a lady that, that was uh, just really helping the kids. Like uh, one was in the restroom and he, he closed the door and, and never turned the light on. She's like, oh, you got to turn the light on. You know, so she's, she's trying to help him with that. And I saw her going around from room to room, just, just uh, you know, greeting the kids in there and, and just being joyful, just being really friendly. And I just thought, man, that, that's awesome. Now, look, I know that a lot of you do that. I mean, it's the truth. A lot of you do. This one just happened to be Diane Carter that I saw this morning. And so just give it up for Diane Carter. She did a great job. And uh, I just love seeing that. I know Tina Campbell this morning when we, we, we get together before service and we have, have what we call a huddle. It's a serve team huddle and we get everybody together and we say, hey, man, people are coming in here. It's going to be a great day. And we just get everybody charged up a little bit. And uh, my wife, Tina, she, she said the word joy. And Tina Campbell just started like, whoo, just just. And for those of you who know her, that's, that's just a strength in her life as well. You know, it's just joy comes out of her. And so that's who we're called to be. I know that, I know that life can kind of get heavy on us and, and, and feels, you know, it just feels dark sometimes. But man, we've, we've got we to gotta stay close to Jesus. We've got to walk in that joy. Amen. Well, I'm going to pray this morning and then we're going to get started. Father, I just thank you so much, God. Uh. Whew. Lord, we've already gone through worship with you. We've had communion, and now we get to crack open the Bible, so to speak, and hear your word for us today. God, I'm asking you to open up our hearts, open up our minds. Father, I pray for those who truly, truly, truly need to know you in a greater depth today, God. I pray, Father, that their hearts would be open, that their spirit would be open to what you are about to say. May your spirit be here strong with us now. May we sense you. May we know that you're here. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. This message is called The Love of the King. The Love of the King. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about a, a journey I was on uh, this past week. Actually, you know, it gets hard to come up here and because I just get so honest. And um, sometimes Tina's like, don't be so honest. You shouldn't be so honest. But... Some, sometimes I am, you know, and it's, it's uh, I, the reason that I do it, though, truly is because I think it helps you guys. I, I mean, it, 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 it does something to say, look, I'm, I'm looking at the pastor, and if the pastor's not doing it right and he can't keep things straight, then I don't feel so bad about it. But, but we're called to get it together and pull it together, and so that kind of happened to me this week. And so I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I do quite often. I'm, I'm driving to the park. And, um, you know, there's times, I'm just going to tell you, there's, there's times in my life where I really struggle with what I'm about to talk about. And um, I'm driving to the park and I'm thinking, God, I just, I just, I just want to love you, God. I just, I just need you, Lord God. I just pray you just show up when we get there and, and that we just have a great time, Lord. And, and, and here's the thing, and I'm, I'm feeling like, I'm feeling like it's, it's kind of hitting a lid, like, like I'm not connecting. And I, and I know that's why I'm going there, but, but. I know that in the last number of weeks, I've just been kind of like experiencing this, and it's and it's happened. It, it it just happens a lot in me. It's part it's part of my own my own heart. It's part of my own flesh that gets in the way sometimes. Um, and so I get to the park, and I and I'm sitting at a bench, and I said, I said, God, I just just love you. Help me, help me, God, to help me, God, to love you more. Help me, Father. And all of a sudden, I sensed him say, the reason that you're not loving me the way you want to 
is because you're always coming to me and you're, you're not wanting me, but you're wanting what I can give you. I said, well, thanks. No. Um, I asked him, though. I said, what am I missing? What am I missing? And that's what he spoke to me. And, and you know what? Truthfully, I, uh, the reason I bring that out is not only to say, look, confess my own sins or something, but because I think a lot of us do that. I think a lot of times we're going to God because we need something from Him rather than going to God because I love Him so much, because I just want to hang out with Him. You know, I just, I just want to be there. And, and here's a th- James 4, 2 to 3, it says this. You do not have because you do not ask God. That's number one. You've got to learn to pray. You've got to learn to ask God. And then he says, when you ask, you do not receive. Why? Why am I not receiving? Because you ask with wrong motives. That's what I was doing that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. I wasn't asking for money. I was asking kind of for something else. I'm not even going to go there. That's none of your business. That's between me and God. But, I, but I, was, I was asking for something that would feel a little bit more like power or something like that. Sometimes, I'll, I'll just say this, sometimes I've gone to God and I'm wanting to be so close to Him because I know when I'm close to Him, there's a greater anointing and there's greater authority and there's greater power. We teach that here because it's true. But when you get those things out of balance and you start chasing him because you want greater power and you want greater anointing and you, fit, you forget to just come to him because I love Jesus. I just want to be with Jesus. And, and here's the thing. I know that my spirit man craves Jesus. Like I know it. I can sense it. I can feel it. I, so there is a real truth in, in me that says I want more of Jesus. I want to know Jesus. Can I be honest with you? I literally want to have that relationship like Moses had. It says about Moses and God that God spoke to Moses as a friend speaks to a friend. I'm just like, gosh, I want that. I want that. It also says that Moses was the most humble man alive. So it wasn't about Moses. It was about God. And God met with him because of that. And so there's still some form of of pride, some form of myself, my flesh that just gets in the way of my relationship with God. And, and I hope, I don't hope, I hope that you understand that and I hope that that helps you. But I hope that, that I hope it's not you, but for many of you, I'm sure that it is. I'm, I'm, we do that. We do that. We, we pray, we, we seek God all for the wrong motives. It could be that, that we've got a problem in our family. And so I know that if I get close to God, that God's going to bring an answer. And, and all these different things, I need more finances, I need this, I need, I need a breakthrough in my job. And, and, we, and we come to him all because of those things rather than going to him because we love him. Because if we seek God first, then all these other things will be added. So we've got to seek God first, and that has to be our motive. And so he was checking my motive. He was checking my motive. What I love about it is he did it so gently. He, he didn't have to pound me on the head. I've got to be honest. I went to him and I said, God, what am I missing? So, so in a way, my heart was completely wrong, but in a way, my heart was right. I knew that something wasn't right. And, and this thing, it does. This, this is one of the things that kind of creeps up in me. I, 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 want, I want the power of God in our church, but sometimes I want the power of God in our church because I want to be seen, because I want our church to be seen. And, and sometimes, and that's the fleshly side of me, that's, that's, the, that's the sinful heart of, of myself that can be on the inside of me. And the truth is, like, my spirit doesn't want that at all. And so there's this conflict, just like Paul. I feel like Paul when I'm talking like this. I feel like there's this conflict, like, like, I don't want that, man. I just want to, I want Moses. I want that relationship. I want to be with Jesus and speak to him like a friend speaks to a friend. I want to go to a coffee house and just hang out with him. I just want to be able to just, God, I'm just so in love with you. And sometimes it gets blocked. It gets all stopped up. So Mark 12, verse 28 to 30, it says this. One of the teachers of the law came, and he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Now, those, that list that he put, that put up there, the heart, the soul, the mind, the strength, those, I believe, are actually right in order. Of course, Jesus would say things in order. And so when he said that, here's the thing. He's saying that, that your heart is where your motives come from. And that's why I can just tell you, there's still sin in my heart. 
You know, I, I mean, we all do. We, we all have a sinful heart. Our nature is sinful, but when we were born again, we are made clean. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's what Paul said. Who can, who can get me out of this pit that I'm in? Who can, who can change? Thank, thank God for Jesus and all that he's done. And it's just, that's where, I'm, that's where I struggle sometimes. And so it's in my heart. It's where your motives are coming from. What's really in your heart? And that's what I would question all of us today. What's in your heart? What's in your heart? What? Because your heart is your true desires. Your heart is your true desires. And I, I believe this. I believe that your spirit can become so strong that it begins to retrain the heart and, and retrain the brain for sure. That's called transformation. Bet, or, uh, uh, when, when you came up here, Betty, I saw, I saw your shirt, and it actually says transformed on the back. It's got a butterfly of us being transformed into who God has called us to be. And then there's the soul, the this, this soul. So we talked about the heart. It's where our motives really come from. The soul is our mind, our will, and our emotion. And, and the thing is, is what we believe to be true and how we think and feel all comes through that soul. So if you've got a wrong motive in your heart, your brain begins to chew on that and think about that. And, and it processes that. And, and it thinks in some ways that that's true. And that's why the brain has to be retrained. The brain has to be transformed. The brain has to be washed through the reading of the word. You've got to get into the word and you've got to actually change your thinking by learning new things like that wasn't true. My, my dad told me I would amount to nothing, which he did not. But I'm just using an example. My dad told me I wouldn't amount to nothing. But the Bible tells me that I'm a child of God. And you start, you start, and I believe this. I believe I'm a child of God, but it takes that, ah, uh, ah, that struggle. And, and for some of us, there are certain areas of our life where, where it left a deep wound in you. And now you're trying to retrain your brain. You're trying to rethink. You're trying to, ah, I've got to, I've got to get the mind of Christ. And I, and I love it. There's nothing more that I, that I love. Oh, two things. Of course, I love seeing people come to know Jesus. I mean, that, that to me is everything. That to me is everything. Secondly, I love seeing change lives because that's what we're all about. Heal, grow, and rise. That's what we are all about here at Spirit Word Church. We want to see people uh, healed up. We want to see people grow up, and we want to see people rise up. That's go and do. I mean, go make it happen. And not, not just like be this Christian, just, just eh, you know, I'm saved, and I'm just going to barely get into heaven. I want you to have a thriving life full of the Spirit of God. I mean, just on fire for Him changing the world get you're, you're you're moving into some kind of calling that's on your life you you may be working at the post office you may be working um at behind a desk somewhere but there is the power of god on the inside of you that's just supercharging that that whole area that whole area around you people know people know when you walk in the room because there's that joy there's that joy and if we're a christian that doesn't have that joy then you need to find the joy we need to go to jesus and learn how much he loves us and that's one of the big things about today one of the key things about today, in order to learn how to love God, you need to know how much He loves you. And, and what, I'm, what I'm kind of teaching today is actually the journey that He took me on as I sat there at a park bench. He just started giving me these different scriptures, and one would lead to the other. And, uh, and, and yeah, I, I did listen to, to another message that was on, on love, but I, I'm just kind of like putting this thing together like, I see, I see where you're going. And he would just drop scriptures in, into me. And they helped me. But in the end, what I realized is I wasn't, it wasn't in me to really, really realize how much he loves me. How much he loves me. The truth in this room, I can almost guarantee you, I have struggled with it so much in my life. I'm, I'm overcoming it. But obviously, I still have a little bit of it. But the truth is, in this room, there are many people, you have no concept of how much God loves you. And if he did, you don't believe it. You believe he can love somebody else like that, but he won't love you. Because you know your own heart. Everybody's heart is fallen. Everybody's heart is messed up. Everybody is sinful, and yet God loves them. God reaches out to them. God's calling out to them. So heart, soul, mind, strength, all those are in order. And see, what happens is when your, your heart, it has, this, um, uh, it has this motive on the inside as to why it does it. The soul, the mind, the will, the emotions, they begin to process it. 
process it. And then your strength actually is you fleshing it out. Whatever that may look like, whatever the motives of your heart, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come out. It's going to come out. So if your motive is, man, I just, I just love Jesus, then the moment that Tina says joy, all of a sudden you're going to go, yay, just spontaneously. I was looking right at her when it happened. It was just like spontaneous. It just, I love that. I love that. And I also know that, that Tina's not perfect. But Tina loves Jesus, man. It was just coming out. And I, I just, it's awesome. It's awesome. Ephesians 3, 17 and 19. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and how long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. First of all, understand this. One, one, of, the, one of the difficult things for any uh, teacher, any preacher, um, counselor, is that you can bring somebody to water, but you can't make them drink, right? And, and that's very difficult because we, we, I put together a message. Uh, you may not know it. I spend hours sometimes on a message, hours on a message, putting that thing together and then trusting that God's going to bring it out of us, uh, fill us with the Holy Spirit, let it come out, God. May lives be changed. And then you got some people that just sit there like, oh, man, I got to go. We're going to, we're still, he's still talking. Are we going to sing a third song? Oh. And you can, everyone else can sense the presence of God in the room, but there's always those that just, they just don't, they're not ready. They, they, they're not listening. They don't, they don't want it. They don't want him enough. They don't want him enough. They might be here in the church. Maybe they think that's good, but they don't want him. And so I'm, I'm challenging you today to, to, to want him, and I'm going to challenge you today to see how big his love is for us and that his love is truly for you. And so it is by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that he opens, how mu- he opens up your heart to realize how much God loves you. So I can say all I want to. Somebody else can tell you God loves you and all that, but it takes the Holy Spirit to really, truly open your heart and bring revelation to you he opens it, and it becomes, re- it's almost like, okay, there's something behind the wall here, or there's a curtain here, there's something back there, and I'm trying to describe it to you, and you're still like, ah, I'm not really getting it, okay, whatever, it doesn't really matter, but then somehow the Holy Spirit just like, shh, pulls the curtain back, and you're just like, wow, and the Holy Spirit is the one who reveals the truths of God to us, and that's why we've got we've to gotta spend some time, some, some of you, some of you, uh, you you're going to have to really push a little bit and say, God, I, I want to know you. I, I believe that's right. I believe what the pastor's saying. And so I'm going to spend the next 35 seconds just, just praising you and just praying. And, and I think I'm going to get it that way. It, it's, it doesn't happen that way. You, you're going to have to push your 35 seconds to maybe 35 minutes. Some of you are just like, whoa, 35 minutes alone with God. Are you crazy? Yeah. You'd be surprised if you'll just start, if you'll just start praying. If, if before you get with God, if you just write down to say, if, if I had to, if I had any things that I needed from God, anything that I wanted to say from God, anything I wanted to say to God, what, what would it be? And you just, you just, you just write it down. You just write those things down. Trust me. Just take that into your prayer closet. You'll be amazed how long you'll sit there and pray and, and just seek after him and, and be with him and just create, just create a small list. Things in your own life of what you need to pray about. Maybe things in somebody else's life that you love. You just want to pray for them. You just begin to write that down. And I'm telling you, you'll have more than enough to spend 30 minutes with God. More than enough. But we're going to have to do that if we want to see true change come into our life. If we want to see true empowerment come into our lives. If we want to see things really dramatically change in our life. We've got to spend some time with Jesus. We've got to spend some time in the Word. We've got to be changed on the inside. And that's what all those things do. They change us change us and it brings the supernatural power of God into our circumstance. Otherwise you're just kind of trying to make things happen on your own and, and so many try to do that all the time. You're, you're always trying to fix things. You're always trying to work things out. You're always trying to, we can, we'll can do this, we'll do that. And, and if you just stop and you'd pray and continue to pray you'd be amazed how the, the miracle working power of God would come into your life and change things around you. So this scripture is also telling us that, that uh, uh, that, that truly that nothing, 
Nothing can separate us from the love of God. I'm sorry, I, I got ahead of my notes there. Um, um, yes, let me read Romans 8, 38, 39. It says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, nothing can stop God's love from coming to you. Nothing. Nothing. I mean, he named off a whole bunch of things, things you wouldn't even think, like angels. Oh, why would an angel? Well, he probably wouldn't, but he can't. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. I don't care where you find yourself, what pit you find yourself in, what, what crack house you find yourself in, what, what horrible defeated mentality you find yourself in, what drunken state of mind you find yourself in. God is his love is still reaching out to you. God's love is still there. He's, he's omnipresent, which means he's everywhere all the time. That is a wonderful thing, and that's a scary thing as well. He is there all the time. We can never get away from him, whether we're at the bottom of the ocean or on the top of the hills. We can never get away, ever, from his presence, never from his love. A lot of times what happens with us you say, okay, uh, the question kind of comes up like, okay, if he's there all the time, why don't I feel him? Why don't I feel him? Because when we sin, what happens is, is he's there and he's waiting for us. And yet at the same time, what's happening is we're walking away from him. We're walking away from him. It feels all alone. It, it feels like he, he's not there. Because you've got to realize that the omnipresence of God is different from the manifest presence of God. And when you're, when you're in tight with him, man, when, when, when I'm at the park or when we're, we're here worshiping, whoo, I just, I'm, I just, I love the presence of God. I can sense what he's doing. I can sense him speaking to me. I can sense him, him even directing where the church service needs to go. And, and I'm, I'm right there with him. And I, and I love that. And that's, that becomes the manifest presence. That's, that becomes the rhema word of God, like his spoken word right there. I'm hearing him speaking to me. All those things are, are, are awesome and they're powerful, but, but it's not always that way with you. But his omnipresence, him being everywhere all at one time is always with you. And so when you sin, it's like you kind of walk away from him and we begin to feel alone. What's happening is we left the father. We left the father, just like the prodigal son did. The prodigal son decided, man, I don't like what the way my dad is. I don't like the rules that he's got. I don't like his kingdom that he has here. And so I'm going to go build my own kingdom. And you start walking away and you start to go be, build your own kingdom. And truthfully, that's what we've all done. That's our sinful nature. We don't want the kingdom of God. We want to build our own kingdom. We like our way better. We want what we want, when we want it, how we want it, where we want it, all of that. We want it. And so we're always constantly trying to build our own kingdom. And he is trying to bring his kingdom to earth. He's trying to get us to realize that his kingdom is far better. And it is far better than our kingdom will ever be. Our kingdom always ends in disaster. That's what happened with the prodigal son. He ends up losing everything. He's, he's feeding pigs. He, he's longing, it says, to eat the pods that the pigs are eating. I mean, I don't know what the pods are. I don't know if they're, if they're, they're some kind of vegetable or something, whatever it was, he's like wanting that and nobody's even giving him that. And so he finally goes home. He finally goes home. He just says, I'll just serve my dad. Uh, I'm, I'm not worthy to be his child anymore. I'll, I'll just serve him. But at least I'll have something to eat. And I just, the prodigal son story is just incredible because there's the dad. There's the dad just, just waiting, just waiting for his son to return. And so, we all become rebellious to the king at some point. We all become rebellious. And it doesn't separate his love from us. And, I, and I, it, that always blows my mind. It, it absolutely blows my mind how I can be a mess, get myself all tangled up into a mess of sin, and turn around and come to reality and say, God, would you forgive me? And I have learned to receive the forgiveness of God. I had to learn that. I don't know about you. I, I struggled with that because I was one that, boy, did I beat myself up. If I got myself all tangled up in sin, 
I, I beat myself up so bad, there's no way that God could ever love me. There's no way. He, 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 he may love you. He may love other people. I, I, know, I know that technically he loves me, but he doesn't really love me. That's kind of how I thought. I don't know how you separate those, but it's like he had to because he's God, but he can't love me. And the truth of the matter is that he still does. And what I've learned now is I, if I get tangled up in something crazy, I can, I can turn back around and it's, it's not being flippant. It's just understanding, God, I just want to come back and I apologize to you for this and would you forgive me? And I'm not, te- I'm, I'm not kidding. Instantly, I could just like, I feel like a hug just comes on me. I sense and know that there's a release of that sin that comes off of me. He's quick to forgive, quick, 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 quick. And it doesn't mean that I just go on and keep on sitting. That's, that's even what the Bible says. Of course not. Of course you don't keep doing that. But I've learned that he is actually very quick to forgive and let's move on. He's constantly like trying to get us to move forward. He hates it when we move backward. He's always moving forward and all of a sudden we do one of these and we, we walk away and he's, he's like, what are, what are they doing? Why are they walking backwards? And so he kind of stops and he waits for us and when we turn around and we're like, I'm sorry. So like, come on, let's go. Let's keep moving. You know, we just, and we just start walking forward. His love is crazy. I mean, his love is so deep. I just, I just, sometimes I don't, I don't understand it. I really don't understand it. And I try to, but I don't. In Isaiah 53, 6, it actually tells us this. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way. We've all done it. We've all walked away and said, I don't want your kingdom. I want to build my own kingdom. Matthew 13, 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had, all he had and bought the field. And the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Now, this is a picture of the kingdom of heaven. This is not a picture of your or my kingdom. A lot of times we've read this story and we said, yeah, so I'm out and I'm looking and I, I find salvation and I'm so excited about it. And so I, I, I bury it again and I go out, man, I'm going to spend everything I got to go get that. And I, and, I, and I do, I said, God, I'll give you everything. And I go back and, I, and, I, and I've, now I've got salvation, it's mine. That is not what that story is about. That story is all about Jesus, who looked for a great pearl, who found a great treasure in a field. He was out looking for it, and suddenly he found it, and he went, and he said, I have to have this. This means everything to me. I'm going to spend everything I've got, including my son Jesus, who I will put on a cross in order to have that treasure, and that treasure is you and I. And it's an incredible, beautiful story. He's saying, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Whoo! The kingdom of heaven is not about us earning something. That would be your kingdom. That would be my kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is what he has already done for us. The kingdom of heaven is about how deep and how wide and how long and how low and how everything his love is for us. That he would look for you, look for you, look for you. He's always calling out for people to know him. And suddenly he finds somebody that says, God, that just kind of reaches up. God, I need you. I don't know you right now. If you're real, then come into my life. And they, they cry like that. And suddenly he finds a great pearl, a great treasure. And he gave up everything for that. Not only Jesus, but just even the fact of giving up heaven to come down here to walk on this dirty world with a bunch of dirty people wallowing in their sins trying to help them and they won't listen trying to trying to bring the kingdom of heaven to them instead they they killed the king himself and he he gave up everything so that you and i could know him and he's trying to express his love to you and i today his love is not hindered because of what you think of yourself or because of what somebody else told you about yourself. His love is there. My hope and my prayer today is that somehow you will truly see that the Holy Spirit will open to you and reveal to you 
that God's love is deep for you. It is big for you. It is deeper than parents loving their own children or a grandparent loving their grandkids. I've said it a million times and I'll probably say it a million more. I would literally give up my life for my kids. Even though there are times where they made me so upset. They, ah, you know, they, 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 they just take you all the way down. You know, it's just, man. But in the end, even in that state, you know, here, this is interesting. Even in that state, so my kids get me really upset. And I'm, oh, I'm so frustrated with them. If you were to come over and start to treat my sons wrong, I'm going to defend them like there's no other. <laughs> even though I'm so mad at them right now. But I will do everything I can to, to keep them safe. I will tear you apart if that's what it's going to take. And that's what God is saying. I'll give everything. I know you're a sinner. I know you've blown it. There isn't one person in this room that has committed a sin that Jesus won't forgive. There isn't one. Because the only sin that's unforgivable is when you don't receive him as your Lord and Savior. That's the unforgivable sin. You just don't want him. You reject him. But sin? That's why Jesus came. To him, it's, 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 I got this. It's already done. The price is already paid. I already paid your penalty. Him dying on the cross was the penalty that, that you and I were supposed to pay. It was the fee, the fine that we were supposed to pay. We were supposed to die. But he did it for us. He paid your price. He bought you. He bought you with a price. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, You are not your own. You were bought with a price. 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ. The sinless, spotless lamb of God. I hope that you open your heart today. Everyone, actually, including myself. I hope that we'll open our heart and realize that God truly does love you, that he wants to have a relationship with you. I heard somebody say it years ago, and I say it every once in a while. He not only loves you, he likes you. He likes you. He created you. You were created in his image. What's not to like? I mean, as far as he's concerned, you look a lot like him. You, you have some of the same things that, that are in him. It's, it's incredible. We were created in his image. Yeah, we sin. We blow it. He still loves you. And he'll forgive you in a heartbeat. And we just have to receive his love. John 3.16, so simple. Worship team, you guys can go ahead and come up here. John 3.16, we, we give this one a lot. I want to do something special with it, though. John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let me just say, it's not, it's not whoever goes to church, whoever pays tithes, whoever lives a good life. It's whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. His goal is not to condemn you and I. His goal is not to beat you down. His goal is not to say, look, you, you, you have failed. I, I, I did everything I could for you, but you're a failure. And, I, and I, I just can't, I just can't. He doesn't do that. If you come to him and you say, God, would you forgive me? He's quick. He's, he's just, boom, there it is. And let me take John 3, 16, and, and that was the NIV version. I'm going to give you the T-I-M version, which is Tim. I'm going to give you my version. It says, for God so loved me. I want you to, I want you to be able to say, this about yourself? Can you say this about yourself? Because to say that God died for the whole world is easy in some ways. I know it's the scripture, and I trust me, I'm not changing the scripture. I'm not rewriting the Bible. I'm just, I'm just helping you to understand it. Because I want you to get out of your mind that, yes, he, he died for the whole world. Because that's, that's an easier concept to, to grab a hold of than, wait a minute, he died for me personally. Like me. For God so loved me that he gave his one and only son, that if I believe in him, I will not perish, but I will have eternal life. 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn me, but to save me through him. Bow your head and close your eyes. Hallelujah. Father, I just pray right now, God, that those in this room who struggle with receiving your love, Holy Spirit, I just ask you to open up their hearts. Open their hearts that they can see how big the love of the Father is. That the Father would give his own Son to die in our place. Because there was nothing we could do about our own sin. So he sent Jesus, his own Son. And the Father allowed his Son to die on a cross to carry the burden of our sin and pay the price of our sin, to pay the penalty of our sin so that we could have life. And Lord, I just ask today, reveal this truth to everyone in this room, even those who know you already. May there just be an expansion in their heart that just opens up and said, God truly does love me. And I can move forward. I can move forward with joy, not just with barely make it, but I can move forward with joy. I can move forward with expectation, with excitement. Open our hearts, Lord. Keep your eyes closed and your head bowed. And I don't know who's all here. I don't, I don't know everyone here. And I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I want to give you an opportunity to receive His love into your life. As I said, the Father gave His Son Jesus up for you and I. Jesus came to earth. We didn't know Him. We didn't recognize Him. We didn't want what He had to say. We wanted to build our own kingdom. And men wound up killing Him. But ultimately, Jesus actually laid his life down for us. He laid his life down that the forgiveness of our sins, the penalty of our sins would be paid in full. As he hung on that cross, his blood was being poured out. His blood washes our sins away. He died on that cross. And the Bible tells us that Three days later, on the third day, he rose up from the dead because sin could not hold him down. Death could not hold him down. He was raised up. He came to life again. And when he did, absolutely 100%, your and my sins were defeated at that moment. The blood had been shed and the resurrection had been made, defeating sin and death forever, forever forever. He doesn't need to die again because you committed another sin. He died once for all of our sins, for all of them. So I want to ask you today, have you ever received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you ever asked him to come into your life, asked him to forgive you of your sins and to come into your life? Maybe you've done that years ago. Maybe it was a couple of months ago. I don't know. And maybe it feels like in many ways, I thought I did it, but it's just like nothing's changed. I don't know where I am with him. I don't really know. Like, I don't know if I die today, if I go to heaven or hell. And sometimes we can even be confused about the whole thing. Am, am I saved? I, I, I don't really know. Well, in all of those cases, you've never received Jesus before, or there's confusion, there's, there's, it feels like something didn't stick. What I want to do today is I want to lead you through a prayer that if you will mean it from your heart, it's not the words of the prayer, it's what's coming from the heart. Remember, the heart has the motive, and it's what's coming from the heart. That's why we get saved. God promises that if you'll truly come to him, if you'll truly repent of your sins, that he will save you 
And for all of eternity, you will be saved. And in the future, whenever you die or whenever he comes back to get us, you will spend eternity with him in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. It will never end. So I want to ask you all over the place. I'm going to have you raise your hand. If you are willing today to say yes to Jesus, you can say, I've never given my heart to Jesus today. Or I want to make sure that I am saved. I just want to make sure of it 100%. If that's you today, I'm not going to embarrass you. Would you just raise your hand real high? Because I want to say this prayer with you. You're in one of the safest places that you can be in. Is there anyone this morning? This is your moment. This is your chance. His love is open to you. But as I said, you have to receive it. You have to be willing. And sometimes out of stubbornness in our own heart, we can't even raise our hand to say yes to Jesus. I'm just going to ask one more time because I feel like there's somebody. If this is your moment. This is your day. Is there anyone, anyone at all that wants to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior today? Do you want to say yes to him? Hey, praise God. I, I don't see any hands. I don't see any hands. And what's amazing is the love of God will allow you to make your choice. You have a free will. I want to encourage you. And the reason I'm doing this is because I still feel like somebody wanted to say yes, but you just weren't able to. but he's longing for you. I can, I can almost, I can, I can sense his broken heart and he's wanting you to say yes. I, I'm just, I don't usually do this, but I'm just going to say one more time. If that's you, if your heart's beating, you're wanting to raise your hand, but you're scared to death. You know that I'm talking to you. I see that hand. Is there anybody else? Don't hide because I said I see that hand. Is there somebody else? Okay, we're going to pray. I just want you to say this prayer from your heart. Really, truly mean it. I'm going to say to the person, if there was another person that couldn't raise their hand for whatever reason, say this prayer from your heart. It's, it's not about the hand. It's just having a heart that will, re, that, that will be open and say, I'm a sinner. I've messed up. Forgive me, God. Make me your child. And so, Father, today we do that. And I want to ask everybody just to repeat this prayer after me. And for those of you who are truly, truly saying it for the first time, then mean it from your heart. That's all that he asks. Just say these words. Just say, Father God, thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross, allowing your blood to be shed, and on the third day, rising from the dead. Today, I ask you to forgive me. And for the first time, I receive your forgiveness come into my life and change me. Holy Spirit, I welcome you to come into my life and quicken my spirit to know you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God.